How do you as an individual, um, how do you, you know, participate? How, what is the value you can add? And start thinking in that way, especially in the early stages of education, is how you as a human being are going to augment and use machines to improve the lives of your, of your family, yourself, and others. I, sorry, I was going to say, I mean, there's an element to be learned here from some of the most successful brands in the world. You know, you look at what Adidas does around creating brand desire, right? So it doesn't start with what's the optimal shoe. They do a lot of thinking about that as well. But they spend a lot of time creating desire and demand. Sometimes it's solving a really technical problem, like a shoe that fixes your pronating and running. Other times it's fixing the fact that you're desperately uncool, but if you have those trainers, you might be slightly cooler, or at least some people may think so. But if you think about you know, creating demand among every person, for somebody it might be, I had, a, I had a client and he was in finance and he was like, I'm not part of this analytics transformation, I don't get it. And then we helped him find $30 million worth of working capital by, and this is a, an amazing use case, right? More quickly connecting the payments coming into their bank account with the accounts receivable, which were taking eight days because the computer was shit. And instead, it took seconds, and all of a sudden, he was like the biggest evangelist. Yeah. Uh, and this isn't, I don't, this is not AI, this is like basic, basic RPA. But all of a sudden, you had this guy banging on to 50 people in the company talking about how amazing this whole data thing was. Yeah. And you just think about, well, what if you could find another 100,000 of them? And you think of it more like kind of mold in a petri dish. You don't need to figure out how to cover the whole thing. You seed it with some sugar, you put in some water and some yeast, and eventually, over time, it'll grow. But I think that while you do need focus, and there are some great examples of task forces around the world of people saying, this matters and we will put effort into it, it's also not getting too close up to it and letting lots of grassroots efforts, whether it's somebody deciding to start something in their kid's school around saying, we're gonna do a kid's coding camp on the weekend, or you know, thinking about SAP, who said we're gonna retrain a third of our folks, and trusting sort of almost in a blockchain kind of way that the system can sort itself out. And I think, you know, you could argue in that sense that actually it's fine for all of us to talk about AI, but really your general public doesn't really want to talk about AI at all. They just want to talk about stuff that works for them. You know, we had a really good example of the young autistic lad that we look after periodically. And he really struggled to communicate with us for many, many years until he got an iPhone. And he, he's got writing age of maybe three or four. And now he sends us big complicated messages because he just talks to the phone and he reads all the messages back and it's just completely changed his life. And he doesn't know what AI is, he doesn't, but he knows he's got a tool that changes everything he does, which is amazing. So, I mean, maybe some of this is just really about language and how we talk about technology and the benefits. So, I should probably ask one of the two cool people who are the ones wearing <laughs> trainers on here, because obviously, as you said, not just the two any trainers. Cool. Not Body just up. any trainers, they're both looking very cool. <laughs> but, I mean, do, do you see the, uh, the sense of, you know, the, the way that we talk about technology, the benefits, is that maybe the trick to this is to get it, talking it, about it? It really that. is. Uh, how many people used some Google product today on their phones? Raise your hand. <laughs> All of us. How many of you woke up in the morning and said, today I'm going to use something about Google? Nobody. We didn't use Google. We found a solution to a problem that we had. Okay, we never buy technology. We think we are buying solutions. Yep. Right? We don't buy trainers, we are buying coolness. Yep. We don't buy, you know, fancy bags, we are buying hipness. Right? We are buying like a certain look. That's really what it is. My mom isn't buying an iPhone or FaceTime, she's buying an ability to communicate with her granddaughter. And that is the trick, and that's the essence. In fact, you know, Liz, I want to contradict you a bit here. Anyone, I know summer vacations are coming up here. Any of you who are sending your kids to coding camps, pull them out. It's a waste of your money. <laughs> it really is a waste of your money because you can pretty much write all that code in an automated way. You should be putting them in camps that teach them how to think, how to construct the right problems to the things they see around them. When you know, the four-year-old comes and asks us why, what? That's the right thing. We snuff that out as they get older because we're like, don't ask all those questions. Just go like code in Python. So that's going to like, you know, get your job at Google. Unfortunately, 10 years from now, sorry. Google code is going to be written by the computers. That the engineers already wrote for them because they constructed the problem set in the right way. So if we and university education, I don't know about the system here, but I think the US education system, liberal arts school, is fantastic. I have two daughters who've gone through that system now. 
once in it, one just graduated. It's, I used to think that having come from, you know, the IIT US, Indian education system that I didn't have very high hopes for the US education system, but I look at what they learn. They learn to learn. That is a skill that stays with you for the rest of your life. You know, the calculus, the physics, those are skills and techniques. The half-life is very short. If you're not going to be an analyst working on spreadsheets every day, you'll forget what DCF meant. But unfortunately, that's what the education system does teach people today. No, but the school, I mean, these colleges actually are teaching them how to learn. I think it's fantastic. We don't give it enough credit. Maybe not all the universities do it. And the Oxfords and the Cambridges of the world, I think, are set in the same I agree. Way. I mean, I was in a meeting with Treasury yeah. a couple of weeks ago, and I was one of the guys there who has come over from Sweden. And we were chatting about the education system. And he said, yeah, I think the education system is great. And the guy from Treasury turned around and said, where do you live? And he said, in London. He said, that's why you think the education system's great. If you look around the rest of the UK, you've got trouble. Mm. But, but actually, Catherine, I'm sure you'd like to dispute the fact that you don't need to learn coding. Well, I would like <laughs> to know if anyone has found a coding camp uh, for their kids this summer, because there just aren't that many in the UK, because I receive all the inquiries from <laughs> anyone who wants one. So I know that, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not living in... Silicon Valley in, in San Francisco, that ecosystem. And I would argue that actually code is superpower. Um, technical skills are superpower, and coding actually teaches you how to solve problems. And when you take someone behind the screen and you actually get them hands on with technology, they actually begin to realize the art of what is possible. They can choose to go deeper and maybe become a data scientist or an AI expert or go do a PhD, or they can just become an incredibly aware and literate CEO of a business that needs to undergo a huge transformation. And that's a big responsibility. CEOs at the helm of companies with tens of thousands of people, especially when those businesses are really genuinely on that burning platform that you talked about. And I would say that a lot of CEOs um, of big companies sitting on that burning platform are really unsure whether they really are on a burning platform or not. And to be able to understand the impact of how technology can help you innovate and change and upskill it is absolutely essential. But we should be very proud in the UK that we got coding on the national curriculum in 2014. It's a fantastic curriculum. I think the next challenge is actually empowering and supporting teachers to bring that curriculum alive in a classroom and giving them all the materials and support that can help them understand how to do that. Isn't the answer somewhere in between? Because I think you're, you're both right. I'm the consultant, I have to say right. it depends. Yeah, <laughs> the thing is, is, what we're saying is, is we have to find a valuable problem to solve and a good way to solve it. Some people can think better in code, in Python. Others, if I went in, I'd probably write you 10,000 lines that you could do and you'd stare at the screen and it would spit something out. Brilliant. But isn't the most important thing to say, how do we think about what are the right problems to solve and then deploy the right skill sets against the way to solve that. And sometimes it'll be AI, sometimes it'll be RPA, sometimes it'll be, you know what, that's actually multiplication, and other times it'll be like, you know what, let's go get out some Post-its. I mean, I'm convinced that Silicon Valley and McKinsey are the reason that 3M is still in business, right? A lot of coding starts on with Sharpies and Post-its. And then there's somebody who can translate that into code that can turn it into the machine that spits out the most amazing answer or pair of trainers that you are most likely to buy. Or it's something you know far more I don't know creative or 